Welcome. I'm Thodoris Gergakopoulos. I'm a journalist from Greece. I will have the honor to moderate this uh, discussion here today. Now, this is the first of a series of events co-organized by Bruegel and uh, the European Youth Forum. Uh, the European Youth Forum uh, is planning a series of debates on policy issues relevant to the future of the European Union all the way up to next year's European election. Now, tonight, we have four distinguished guest guests we hear with us. Um, I will probably int pro properly introduce them in a few minutes, but first I will try to frame the conversation because the future of Europe is a big place. Uh, there are dozens, maybe hundreds of things one can uh, talk about on that uh, particular issue. Um, so we can narrow it down to two things for today, democracy and civil society. I'll give you five points. Uh, I encourage you to think about them. Our speakers will touch upon them in their own uh, particular way. The first is young Europeans and their political engagement, uh, the low turnout in European elections, low representation in European Parliament and in institutions, structural and legal issues on that, what can be done about them if they really exist, how can we draw more people into European politics? The second related to that is citizenship and ed education, how to improve political literacy about Europe inside the European Union public discourse. Uh, also, European elections, institutional transparency. Is there really a democratic deficit in the Union? Or maybe is there just a perception of one, which is a problem in itself? And is, are there policies to solve either problem? Also new challenges for European democracy. Uh, the rise of populism, how technology shapes citizens' decision-making process, uh, foreign meddling in elections, all those issues have an impact on public opinion and in particular in the, public opi and in the opinions of uh, the youth. And finally, the shrinking civil space, our second topic that we can discuss today, how to give a more prominent, uh, recognized and valued role to civic society. Um, in general, but in particular in the European Union decision-making process, how we can ensure that civil society organizations can have the space, the resources to take part in the decision-making. Now, our experts will weigh in some or all of these issues and we will discuss them afterwards together. And now allow me to briefly introduce everyone now, and then everyone will speak in turn. I'll introduce them in the, in the, um, as they will speak afterwards. Our first speaker is Luis Alvarado Martinez. He's the president of the European Youth Forum since last year, January of 2017. He has been active within the European institutions and in civil society organizations, promoting youth issues, and youth participation in European politics. Alice Mary Higgins is an Irish, uh, Irish senator and the leader of the civil engagement group in Siena de Erin. She's a lifelong advocate of social and economic uh, equality. She has worked on a series of economic and social issues from a fair state pension system to international human rights and from workers' rights to family policy. Roberta Metzola is a member of the European Parliament from Malta since 2013. She is a lawyer, she is an expert in European law, and has a long experience working in European institutions and in Malta's permanent representation in the EU as an attaché and as a um, councillor, uh, as a council on uh, legal issues. And you probably know uh, Gunther Wolf. He's the director of Bruegel and an economist. He's an expert on uh, the European economy and governance, European governance and also on global finance, on uh, monetary and fiscal policy. Now, the format of this discussion will be uh, simple. We'll, we'll kick off with short 10-minute statements from the panel. A hopefully lively debate will follow with you asking questions and the panel expounding on issues. Now, here's an interesting difference with other panel discussions. If you have something, a burning question that you cannot wait to answer, after one of the participants has finished speaking, raise your hands. We may give you uh, the microphone. You, you may ask the question because we have been asked to have this discussion more interactive 
So in that, um, in that same topic, I do encourage you to step up, be inquisitive, uh, encourage discussion, make notes, engage with the, the panel, or otherwise I'm going to do that for you. So first, let me uh, ask Luis to kick things off. Let's hear from you, the president of the European Youth Forum. Perfect, thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? I'm very loud, so probably. Um, so first of all, thank you, Brugo, for, for hosting us here. It, it's really a pleasure to cooperate with you. And, and I think as, as it's, it's been mentioned already, for those of you, that I, I know that there's a lot of members of the European Youth Forum. So this, uh, as, as it's been mentioned, is a series of events, a series of spaces that we also create with you, where we bring experts and where we want to bounce ideas of you, we want to hear thoughts from you, and where we start the conversation on the road towards the European Parliament elections, the discussions around the future of Europe. So we really, uh, I would say, the main actors of this, it's you. So we really look forward to hearing from you, make sure that uh, you make this uh, participatory and engaging and really feed into this process because this is going to be one of the spaces where you're going to be able to feed into what the Youth Forum is going to be doing. Um, so very fast, I don't want to take a lot of time, so I think my reflection, initial reflection is around um, young people obviously and, and how young people are positioned right now in the current system and, and how that is affecting some of the, some people call it lack of participation or apathy, some people call it. Um, and uh, I think, I, I want to start with, I think it was Ban Ki-moon, or, or the former Secretary General of the UN, who said, this generation is the first generation with a capacity or the, uh, to be able to, to be the first generation in history to be able to have the skills and the resources to end poverty, for example. But it's the last generation who will be able to, um, to save or, uh, climate change and deal with sustainable development. So I, I think that kind of is how I want to start the, the discussion. This is a generation that has so much at stake, has so many resources, skills, and platforms uh, available to them, yet is also one of the most oppressed gen young generations in history. And um, this generation is a disruptive generation by nature. Uh, we see the biggest disruptions in society right now in every single sector, be it technology, be it media, be it pop culture, be it politics, are being driven by young people themselves. And this is not because, uh, I mean, this clearly shows that young people want to engage and want to shape the different systems. The, the, I think one of the challenges that we identify is that sometimes the system don't, doesn't know how to read that participation. And the participation of this generation comes in a, in a variety of different ways. And not only in the formal voting or formal participation every four years. And I was reading an article this morning. I live in London in the UK. and I, I laughed this morning a lot because they, they were saying how the milkman business or the milk uh, was coming back because millennials uh, entitled as they were, they were deciding that they wanted to cut plastic completely out of the equation because they cared about sustainable development. So therefore, there was a new industry being created just for this generation. And it sounded as a joke, but this, I think, gives us indication of like this generation, even with their choices, even with the choices that they uh, choose, the products that they choose, they make conscious political choices every day from their clicks on social, social media, the products they buy, or the products they, they choose not to buy. Um, is creating a disruption and is really radically changing and turning the conversation around. Um, and this is because it is, regardless of participation in formal elections or not, it's a gen the most politically educated generation. It's a, a generation that has grown up with a motto of wanting to change reality with values of solidarity because they've been left out of the conversation. Uh, and sometimes they, they struggle in that power relations in institutions, they face that lack of representation, they don't see young faces in political parties, in, in governments, in institutions, or even the private sector, and therefore they disrupt the system in another way because they want to change the rules. Uh, and um, I think to close that, um, there is a real opportunity in Europe, especially in, on the run-up for the European Parliament elections, to turn that conversation around and to use that Somebody, so I, I came recently from an event in Bulgaria, which was uh, <laughs> disruptive itself, and we'll talk about it this weekend. But uh, uh, there was one phrase that really marked me, and it said, you know, the, the Europe right now needs the, mo the most powerful renewable energy that exists in this planet, and that's young people. Young people, their energy, their drive, and their inspiration, and the way their, their will to push the limits, push the boundaries, and 
change the rules of the game because the, rule, the current rules of the game are not equitable, don't support uh, gender equalities, are oppressive, there's a power struggle and the power relations are not sustainable, and they're creating inequalities. So I think there's a real opportunity if given the space in political parties, and give, if given the platforms, if given the resources through youth organizations, if given incentives to be able to be part of the conversation, there's really a lot that Europe could get and that this would be able to make Europe become that global competitive player, an inspiring player when it comes to values uh, around the world that we want it to be. So yeah, I think I, I want to close it there and, and I really hope that, you, that to hear from you. Uh, and yeah, that Youth Up Europe. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Luis. So if anyone wants to jump in, I have questions noted for Luis later on. Later on. Uh, let's hand the mic over to Alice. Mary, uh, would you like? Yeah, this sure. One, you, you're wired. Oh, I'm wired, so yeah. I can, so if everyone can hear me. Um, okay, so uh, I'm really glad to be here. We're, we're at the moment in Ireland, we're commemorating uh, 100 years um, since um, women won the vote, so 100 years in suffrage. And uh, I'm, I'm also hoping that in Ireland on this centenary of that, we'll also be winning an important referendum around reproductive rights and equality for women, which is coming up in a, a few months and a few weeks' time. But I'm, I'm not going to do it for them. But I, part of it, though, but it is exciting then to be part of, you know, as a European, a conversation about enfranchisement as Europeans and what that means. And I think, as you know, was already said, it's important that democracy and political participation is, is and has to be seen as far more than voting. There are big debates around voting, uh, around ensuring that we have the vote at 16, and those are debates we're having in Ireland, and I'm sure in all of your other countries it's something I support. And indeed, looking at European parliamentary reform and, and maybe looking at changing some of the ways we do European parliamentary elections. Um, I think that's something that's going to be important, as well as, of course, the power to legislate for a European Parliament and to initiate legislation, which I think, again, is part of that dem democratic accountability. But I think, uh, as well as that question of voting, of democracy, and I think there has been as well a need, there's a need to send from the, all of the European institutions an enthusiasm about democracy in all its forms, be it at local level, within unions, at national level, because I think Europe has sometimes failed to send an enthusiastic message about democracy in the different spheres that it's happened. And that's part of us then generating enthusiasm about European democracy and European elections. But as well as that, what's important is not just who is voting and when they're voting, but it's about what spaces and what topics are open for political debate and for public debate, because that's what gives the energy and substance to democracy. And in that sense, the economic is, is crucial, and the approach to the economic. Not simply because uh, poverty and precarious work uh, we know that they affect people's capacity to participate and, the, and to plan not only their, their own lives, but to participate in the shared planning and the shared thinking about the future. And those are huge issues to tackle in terms of uh, poverty. Uh, but there's also, there has been a reality that many, many people have seen and citizens have seen how, for example, short-term fiscal targets have constrained their feeling that they can impact the decisions that their governments are making, the decisions that are being made, their ideas about what the future might be, their idea of what a sustainable economic plan in the future might be because of those short-term fiscal targets. And there's a confidence to be restored there now. And I think that's been recognized to some degree with the social pillar. But the social pillar has been kind of reinvigorated because there's been a recognition of a lo loss of social cohesion and a loss of public confidence in their capacity to shape Europe. And it's very important that the social pillar, as it comes in now, is not seen as a kind of a flourish atop the economic pillar, but that it must have weight and substance in its own right. And I do recognize that it is now trying to tackle the issues of precarious work and of social payments. But of course, it needs to go further than that and restore that social fabric and that social engagement, which is the ground from which democratic participation emerge. Um, uh, the other thing as well is we have to be clear that there are areas which have been kind of kept to the side from the democratic process, areas like trade policy, where we haven't had enough to engagement. I won't go into the depth of that because it's an area I could talk about all day, but I think it's important to note that it was, I think, a powerful, positive move for European democracy and confidence in it, that we saw both the civil society pressure that came in around trade agreements, 
uh, around CETA, for example, and now that the European Court of Justice has been shown to make rulings. And I think it's important for that confidence in checks and balances and in a sense that you, for example, by signing a petition in a citizen's initiative can have some impact on the decisions made in areas like trade, which in turn, of course, affect the space that is open for debate in terms of regulation or environmental policy and all of that. Um, one of the great lines that's always used to kind of discourage parliamentarians and indeed from, from throwing their opinions in on the economic areas, you know, the idea that it, kind of it's maths. It's complicated, it's maths, it requires expertise. And that same argument has been used uh, in relation to big data. And we've been told, you know, it's algorithms, you know, uh, very much discouraged from as parliamentarians. Going in. And I think one of the things to really celebrate at this moment in Europe is that Europe has grappled with that. And I think the general data protection regulation is actually an, a momentous moment um, for democracy on a global level. And we are being looked to globally as the model right now. And, and that is an important thing because it does assert uh, that it's not simply that's anywhere that there is uh, power and that money is changing hands is an area that should be up for public debate, political debate, and indeed uh, regulation. And I think it will be important that we now follow and build on that in terms of how we regulate uh, the manipulation of that space in terms of uh, the manipulation of the online space in terms of democracy. And I think it's entirely possible and doable and can be achieved. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll get to discuss it, I hope, <laughs> further. Um, in terms of civil society, Again, uh, this is a phenomenon I used when I used to work with the National Women's Council in Ireland. I found sometimes women were being invited in to talk about you know, their experiences, and then men would come in as the experts to explain their experiences to them. I think it's really important that, a civil, that civil society is understood not just there as a source of um, you know, giving us information on the impacts or alleviating the impacts of decisions, but that it be recognized as a repository of analysis of ideas, and that it be in, put into positions and spaces where it can actually shape the political as well as respond to the political agenda. And I think that's crucial. Again, I think a European Parliament, which could respond to civil society by initiating legislation, would be one step towards that. But we do need to do a lot more, and we do also need to have a solidarity right now, because there is a strong constraint and backlash against civil society that's happening across Europe. We are seeing the narrowing of the capacity to criticize. We are seeing, and indeed actually procurement policies that came in under austerity helped to create that, the tension between those who are delivering services. Are they also going to have a voice where they can critique and challenge and, and talk about maybe the policies that led down to those services? So it's really important that we have solidarity with each other, I think, across Europe in that right now, and that we don't let the divisions, even within civil society, which are being sown, um, those who would try to say, because I think we all need to recognize that when somebody comes with a different experience, those who are, for example, working with people with a disability, people who are working with migrants, those who are working on gender equality issues, that we never be allowed to compete, but instead we say to each other, you are bringing important information of the lived experience of what it is to be you know, a human in Europe at this time, and you have ideas, and how can we cross-pollinate those ideas? And I think that's going to be more and more of a battle because we do have a language of division that has been put forward. Um, I know I'm only, I don't know how I'm, so I'm times. Oh, oh, I'm okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to, uh, I'm so many things, uh, exactly. So um, one thing that I think we do need to look to in terms of civil, and we'll come to the practical parts of it too, but, one thing that I do think we do need to be very, very aware of um, is something that can be a threat to democracy at the moment. And that threat to democracy is if we allow the, uh, ourselves to slip into the language of crisis. The language of crisis is the thing that's always invoked to say, yes, absolutely, we'll have social inclusion and we'll do all of these wonderful things, but at another time when it's more convenient, when we don't have a real problem. And that language is what constrains us from actually engaging. So I think the language of crisis, the framing of the immigration crisis, Europe does not have an immigration crisis. What we do have is a very real danger in terms of Europe's role in terms of, and credibility in international human rights at a time when Europe has an important role to play in international human rights if we compromise our human rights standards. So what, what it gets framed as an, as an immigration crisis is actually an inclusion crisis in some points. 
because our mechanisms, our structures, our policies are not there in place in the right way to ensure that we really build inclusion, that we have social inclusion, that we can fight against um, the quick narratives of division. And because we are compromising those human rights, but I won't go into it further in terms of some of our policies. That's important because if we want our Europe to continue to be a beacon for democracy and human rights globally, we need to live up to that. Um, and, and, and in that regard, the other part of that is the, the security crisis. We're at a ho hawkish moment worldwide. I think it's very clear to everybody. And we desperately need peace building and we need Europe to be a leader in terms of peace building not simply in terms of securitization, but in terms of peace building. I think that's really important. And I am concerned, though I won't go further into it for now, but I'm concerned about PESCO and the new agreements we've signed, and the fact that the word peace, peace building, or peacekeeping, do not appear anywhere in the lengthy notification document. What we do see instead is a lot of complicated spending plans. And again, while we have the social pillar and it's reinvigorated, it doesn't have those same commitments of resources underpinning it. And it's important. We've seen the young people in, in the United States at the moment who have been so strong in coming out against the gun lobby. And I think we've, it's kind of been an invigorating moment for anybody in politics. But we do need to be ensured that the young people of Europe are very strong in challenging the military industrial dynamic, and coming, which is here in Europe, and saying no. We want these discussions to take place in the democratic space. We want diplomacy. We want better and more diplomacy. And I think that, that's important because it's part of democracy. I'm coming to my end, and I realize this is, I'm saying this not simply because of my views, but I think if we're passionate about Europe, we have to avoid any return to big power politics, both within Europe or externally to Europe. I think it's really important, and we also have to fight against the retreat into narrow nationalism, which I know that everybody will be finding and feeling on the ground. The countries. Narrow nationalism plays into big power politics because it brings us back to a dynamic of patronage. If we're passionate about multilateralism, and this is, I think, the opportunity to say to people, multilateralism, having all these voices coming together, the very fact that it's possible, and Europe is the example that it's possible, is what leads to a long-term growth, to sustainability, which protects democracy in all our countries. And we need to be enthusiastic about it and a model of it so that we can be a champion of it globally. Because it is the only way that we are going to challenge, face challenges like climate change and the other. I have my last sentence, which is just to say, um, I do believe, oh, and actually a, a very, well, no, I'll leave it for now. Another couple of points which I'm abandoning. Um, but one important thing I do think to say is, is that we cannot be complacent about Europe at the moment. But the, the opposite to complacency is not cynicism. Uh, it's creativity and it's challenge. And I do think that the young people who are part of these movements and in, in, in all across Europe are the repositories for challenge and for creativity. And I would encourage you to constantly not just fight for your democratic participation, but fight for the democratic space and push for new areas and drag new areas of decision making into political debate uh, in a constructive way. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now, some of our panelists uh, have to leave for the airport in a very few minutes. It's okay. So we'll move along uh, to Roberta. Speak in the European Parliament, I'll take advantage of my 10 minute window to spend 20 minutes in, uh, in order to compensate, but just to, um, I will be much shorter than that. First of all, thank you. Uh, I spent most of my youth in the Youth Forum um, uh, doing a lot of things that you, Lewis, are doing, and I can tell you that you mentioned Ban Ki moon. I think Kofi Annan said exactly the same thing to us <laughs> 10 years earlier. <laughs> and the questions are still the same, the challenges are still the same. But when I was there um, with um, uh, um, the Irish Prime Minister currently, who was born on exactly the same day as me, and he was in IEP and I was in EDS, um, we never thought that all these years later, we would be myself in the European Parliament and him as the Prime Minister. And my message to you, first of all, is that whatever you're thinking, if you think that politics is for much later, it's not true. If somebody had to come to me today, aged 39, to run for any election whatsoever, whether it's local, national, or European, I would say, no way. 
uh, it is way too hard and it is way too difficult and expensive. If you, any of you have the possibility to run for any election in order to do good, you will be saving the next generation from thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of armchair critics of saying, why should I vote? All politicians are the same anyway. My country has just given the vote um, with cross-party political support to 16-year-olds. So next year... So next year, uh, if, on the 25th of May next year, uh, the whole country will go to vote for the European Parliament and for the local elections. I first ran for the European Parliament when I was 24. And I remember thinking, how am I going to convince the people I'm speaking to that my expertise in European politics is going to translate into tangible um, good things if ever I get elected. Now, I didn't get elected then, I didn't get elected the second time, I got elected nine years later, finally. <laughs> but then I remembered my very first challenge, and that challenge is still the biggest one I have today. Now, I sit in the Civil Liberties Committee uh, for the EPP group. I, say, I, I, I coordinate my group in that committee, and we deal with migration, we deal with terrorism, we deal with security, and we deal with rule of law. And I mentioned these four specific chapters because they overlap all the time. How am I going to, to make sure that I have members who do not automatically equate migrants with terrorists? How am I going to address citizens' security concerns with the economic argument of the French borders are still closed two and a half years after a big domestic terror attack? How am I going to, to cross or, or um, bridge the divide between a politician who comes to the European Parliament, and any of you want to go online will see that a foreign minister of a particular member state came three, uh, five hours ago to the, my committee and basically told all of us two things, that a huge electoral majority gives a government the right to run roughshod over everybody's constitutional and fundamental human rights. The second thing this foreign minister said is that the result of the election in this particular country sent a clear message that those citizens do not want to have anything to do with the, left, with the European Parliament's left-wing fixation with migrants. Now imagine what I have to do in order to respond to that kind of argumentation. How am I going to rebut that kind of argument which will then generally very much resonate with my population if my population thinks that it is okay to have a referendum on migration. Look at yourselves and think what the result of a referendum on migrants would have in your countries. Conveniently forgetting that that government's obligations to protect people who are eligible for protection stems from a refugee convention that everybody had to sign up to when that country entered the European Union. It is so very convenient for governments to spend years trying to convince the European Union that all is well, only for them to very conveniently forget all that they signed up to once they joined the European Union. Because in the European Union, we do not have a mechanism that tests rule of law in a member state. My country, and I can say it here, is currently facing massive rule of law challenges. There are another four or five countries, and, I, and these countries are in different political groups. So I am from the EPP group. You can guess which government is a problem in my, in my own political group. The government in my country is a socialist government, so my, my socialist counterparts have my country as a problem. Romanians are, have, have a, a, a question, a, 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 an issue with the socialist group and in the liberal group, and the conservatives have Poland. So all of us, all political groups, have an issue with one of their member parties. How do we deal with that? Because till today, 
After the financial crisis in 08 and 09, all our governments signed up to an obligation that every year national budgets are put for the Commission to approve or reject, depending on whether the, 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 the broad strokes and guidelines are met. On democracy, on equality, on dignity, no mechanism exists. And governments come say, you are now in opposition, you have no right to speak. The same minister this morning told us that the NGOs that were targeted in his country were those that were um, uh, um, uh, helping the opposition. And the opposition won and lost massively, and therefore they cannot say anything anymore. The moment we say this is the moment that we have lost any kind of moral authority in the European Parliament to guide against populism, to counter the populist narrative. Now, does that mean me facing an election in one year's time? What can I do to make sure I get re-elected? You know, the easiest would be to adopt exactly the same arguments. But I entered politics when I was your age precisely because I had an ideal. That ideal meant that my country joined the European Union um, with the vast majority of the young people of my country having voted for that accession. But today, People who are your age don't remember my country outside the European Union. So it's useless for me telling them, you know, I fought for you to be here. Or I fought for you to get an EU job. That doesn't matter. What I have to make sure is that my political discourse is not easily swept up in populist rhetoric simply because that is what gets me the popular vote. And to do that, I will need the help of people like you in this room to be able to go around their homes, their villages, their countries saying we need to have the next European Parliament, because this is what I'm afraid of, that the next legislature will be much more extremist than the current one. And to prevent that, it is only young people who can reverse the trend that we have seen um, in the United Kingdom, that we have seen in the United States, and that we have seen, frankly, in a number of member states. So I'll stop here. I need to go to the airport, not to catch a flight myself, but to give my car to my sister. I know I'm giving you too much information. <laughs> but anyway, but I managed to get myself into this thing because I ha we are a big Catholic family at home, and I have to be a Christian and, send, and, and go pick up my sister from the airport because I promised her because she has young, young children. Um, so I will leave at 5.55, um, but I, I, if I don't get the chance to speak to you again, I would like you to take these thoughts because these are real dangers we are facing, and there might be a point of no turning back in one year from now. If, if someone has some questions for uh, Roberta, or anyone else who has spoken so far. Would you like to move on to uh, Guntram and then? But then we don't have a chance to ask her. So if you want to so ask her. A final chance. I would, I would just add, I think, Robert, I think you, you are spot on with many of the issues. And I think um, you mentioned that the young people now, it is true that sometimes young people don't remember. But I think if we turn that around, we see that this is the first pro-European generation by birth. And that, sometimes people see it as entitled, but it also makes us a generation that when things get complicated and we don't know how to move forward, we go back to the value system. And the value system of this generation is Europe is about solidarity, Europe is about not creating more borders, Europe is about putting, creating spaces for those, for those women, those people from other genders, people who've been oppressed or who haven't been in positions of power, the same as young people, how do we open structures for those? Because the designing of the political framework is different when there's a diversity in power. Uh, and I think um, that is something that people in government, the people in positions of power need to be able to read. And I, I think you do a very good job at it. Uh, but how do, we even, how do we tell that story? How do we give that narrative? How do we create incentives for this generation who is dealing with a whole set of different challenges, because the challenges of today are different? And how do we reach out and incentivize them to say, hey, your voice is 
it's not about disrupting the world as you're doing it in a million different ways, but this part, this kind of disruption also has an impact. Um, so I think it's that there's generally a, an issue of how do we tell that story and how do institutions align the narrative to be able to be more, much more inclusive. I, I had one sentence, which is just, uh, I really enjoyed what you were saying. I think it's really important uh, and, and interesting. But uh, I was very struck by you said about how we had this very clear, visible structures around fiscal, financial, you know, and I'm not, you know, it's not to be against them, but they were very visible and people could see them. But those structures, as you say, that idea that Europe would also be there running to assert around social justice issues, around social, you know, so be it, is it bringing that into the European semester? Is that part of it? Is it about what other structures? So basically, how can we make Europe show the Europeans that it is as passionate about the social and about the human rights elements, which make people care about Europe as the financial... Uh, well, you know, we are going to start terms. budget negotiations, right, for the yeah. next uh, fi um, financial um, uh, term. And this is when we have to make these arguments very visible. So, for example, in my committee on, on, uh, on the, the initiative of a Polish colleague of mine from Civic Platform, we have uh, uh, requested a European values instrument to be inserted in the next um, budgetary framework. Now, if you listen to anybody who works with the European Commission, um, they are really panicking because they don't know how this is going to fit anywhere. Um, but this was done specifically in response to what you said um, uh, Madam Semen, Senator, on the shrinking space for civil society. In countries where you have governments verging on autocracy, and we'd say autocracy even if they were democratically elected, when they verge on autocracy, the only um, uh, way to counter their power is through civil society. So what do those governments do? They suppress the NGOs, first thing they do. Next, they, they suppress academic freedoms and close the borders to foreigners which are there to bring in uh, cultural change. Um, and that, that is where we can make a difference by making sure that the next mandate that we have, whoever gets elected, will actually have the tools to do so. It's useless just talking if we don't allocate, first of all, money. And secondly, and this is a little bit of a controversial point, but I'll make it anyway, um, we also have to look at some point at the way MEPs get elected. We have countries with direct proportional electoral system, like mine. In other words, where if for people, when I get elected, so I got elected in 2014 again, after 2013 I got re-elected, people elected me because they chose me. They said, look, I want to vote for Roberta. There are many, many other countries whereby the political parties choose a list. And I have met so many members of the European Parliament who tell me, we have campaigns where I am sent to a place where I've never been in my life because there is a more powerful candidate on my district and therefore I have to go to fill the party quota in a place where I am irrelevant. I have met a UK member of the European Parliament who told me I would give one million pounds for somebody to recognize me in the street. <laughs> I almost thought I have the opposite problem but it doesn't matter, I won't say that. But the thing is this, that if you have um, electoral systems which generate disenfranchisement of the voters, then no wonder that you have countries where less than 15% of the population votes for the MEPs. And then when the next election comes, they're like, I don't care about in Brussels. These are people who just, you know, spent five years in Brussels because we never see you, because they're not even obligated to show up. Whereas in my case, I have to go to, to Malta every week, and I go once or twice a week, I fly down, and I, I have to consolidate and work on my electoral base. If I don't it's do smaller, that, no? there is no way. But, you have to admit it's much smaller. But it's the whole country. Oh, right. It's but the it's whole country with one people, airport. But it's much, much fewer people. So it's 450,000 people. Yeah. But, but at least I have the whole country. So right. it, it, the choice could have been when we were setting up our electoral system that we would have split the country up into, no, into regions. Didn't split it up we into didn't region. okay. on purpose so that I have the whole country, which means that I am voting on regional policy. It affects right. also the island, islands outside, gotcha. outside my, my country. So that's also one thing that you could actually um, push for, that the systems are much more transparent in choosing the candidates.
If you could elaborate a little bit more on what Luis said on how you speak to the young people who don't remember a previous situation. I come from the South. Our young generation, 17 to 24, don't remember their country, not, as, not just outside the European Union, but without the in the crisis. Union, crisis yeah. not being in how do you speak to them? By the way, in some countries, younger Europeans are uh, more pro-Europe, in the South, they're more anti-Europe than older generations. How do you speak to them? That's oh, well, uh, well, maybe just because I think the first step would be not speaking to them, but speaking with them. So, uh, so I, I think I, I think that's generally the. They don't count. They're our members. They're, <laughs> they have I think to you clap. prepared them. You know, you have one line. They have to clap. Time. It's it's all prepared. But I, I think. Because, you know, uh, and this is uh, uh, generally one of the issues, and it comes from very in innocent kind of like, how do we help the young people? So I, I think because this generation has grown up how, how, how it has grown up with, with, you know, such much more access to education, much more access to technologies, interconnections all over the world, because all of this has happened while they were growing up with technology, access to information, access, access to platforms that raise their voice, the conversation needs to change, and, and we can no longer keep saying, hey, young people, you know, you should be thankful for everything we did for you, because uh, it, it just the conversation needs to radically change. So because they're so informed, they know. I mean, as, as much as you, uh, the argument of young people don't really know, deep down, young people know that there's no borders. Young people know that they can travel, they can uh, uh, study, work, Young people know what discrimination is because they face it. Young people know what is not being able to buy a house today when their parents bought a house at the same age. Young people know today what not being able to have kids whenever they choose to. So the young people, are, this is a conversation that is going on on their lives every single day. So being able to have a conversation between equals and saying, you're a generation with a lot of access to power. How do you become part of the, of, of the solution? And what do you, um, because you would be amazed what a young person with a platform and a voice can do today. It, it, it just can blow your mind. It's scary sometimes. <laughs> so I think it all starts by ch changing that, that mindset. Is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, one thing, when I was in the youth forum, no prime ministers were age 35. That is one massive change that we have seen that the a polit a politician's life, when I was younger, used to be a, a career that spans 30 years. Now it's 10 years max, and you're out, and you, there is much, it's much easier to go from public sector to private sector and back. I think that is something I would create a bit different, different in different member states, but there is uh, that idea that uh, if I was able to take a decision <laughs> on my country's future and my own future at 18, why am I not capable to do it at 16? Um, it's interesting to see that um, a lot of people I meet who disagree with the votes that we gave to the 16-year-olds are 18-year-olds. <laughs> because they think, you know, like, yeah, two years ago I had no idea. <laughs> what also pains me my a grandma, bit... My grandma also has no idea. Yeah, yeah. She's 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen 16-year-olds that are much better than average 50-year-olds. But, but another thing that, that pains me, and this is a personal in, in my country, is that more young people are willing to talk about legalization of marijuana than corruption or the environment and sustainable development. That's very different to how it was before, uh, when uh, 20 years ago. I keep saying this, but yeah, it's, uh, it was 20 years ago. Um, and I have to learn how to adapt to that. Right? I have to learn. Not, I, I'm not going to tell anyone what to tell me. Uh, so I spend most of my time, uh, once a week I have a commitment that I go to a different school and I speak to 14 and 15 year olds, not university graduates. I speak to them when they are 14 and 15. Um, and I try to, to explain to them what we do and how they could one day be doing what I'm doing. And that alone, if I were, had been 14 and someone told me that, I think I, I would have 
been able to, to be much more inspired even before we joined the EU, et cetera. But there are so many things in terms of traveling, in terms of educational opportunities, that for students, I'm less worried than for people who are today 25, who have not uh, very high educational qualifications. And you know already that for the next 30 years, that person's position in the economic cycle is so much more vulnerable. And how to target them is a huge challenge beyond um, uh, how we can have a massive vision for the country, but rather for them it's how they are going to make the paycheck next year, next month. That is what is a huge challenge for us, and this is, again, you know, you can have the centre-right parties disagreeing with the centre-left, but ultimately it's a challenge that we have to get together to solve. Otherwise, we will have whole generations of disenfranchised um, um, sectors of the population that we will never be able to reach unless we tackle them now. Okay, okay, so I have to go. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So finally, we can now hear from the director. Well, um, so welcome also, also, oh, don't forget you're back, absolutely. So welcome, the car keys are probably in there, right? So <laughs> you would have noticed. <laughs> well, welcome also from, from my side. Um, so uh, I, I thought I, I would make, uh, make basically two points. And the first point starts by revealing my age, I'm 43. And I was wondering who uh, in the room thinks that I'm actually a young man. Okay, oh, you are <laughs> devastating me. <laughs> well, the reality, the, reality, the reality is that I'm younger than the median voter in Italy and the median voter in Germany. What's the median voter? That means that more than 50% of the voters in Germany and in Italy are now older than 50 years. Okay, I'm younger than 50 years, so I'm on your side. <laughs> so I think that's actually an important thing to keep in mind. We have a very, very demographic transition and our societies are getting older and the average voter is getting older. And if you look at what has happened throughout this crisis of the last 10 years, this financial crisis, you will see that a lot of policy choices have been taken that have been to the detriment of the young. I published in 2015 a paper that's called The Intergenerational Divide. Um, and the paper actually shows that um, there was a lot of rhetoric um, at the beginning of uh, the financial crisis in 2010 about how we need to uh, keep up uh, spending for young, for families, for research, for education, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, if we need to do budgetary cuts, we need to do them with pensions, we need to do them with um, entitlement programs for those that are already well, well established and so on. So there were lots of declarations on this. There's, for example, um, a European Council in 2010 that signed this, so the European heads of state and government signed a joint commitment on this, that this is the way uh, we should um, address uh, budgetary shortcomings in our budgets. And in 2015, I looked at the data, and um, the reality is, as you can imagine, the opposite. So what you see is that um, entitlement for uh, so spending on research, spending on uh, universities, spending on mobility for young people, spending on families, uh, was cut much, much more strongly than spending on pensions, uh, spending on uh, those that uh, probably are uh, in the old age group above 50, not uh, in the age group below 50. And so, so I think that's actually, and if you look at the Brexit vote, um, that's just another example. Uh, Brexit was, uh, a vote, was a vote of the old. Um, the young predominantly voted for staying in the European Union. The old voted for uh, uh, being uh, for, for leaving the European Union. Now, some, th some say, well, perhaps it's a result of um, uh, the young not going to the polls, and it's right. I mean, a lot of the young British people actually did not go um, to the electoral polls. However, if you look a little bit deeper into this, the research actually shows quite clearly 
that even if all the young generation had gone, um, all the eligible young voters had gone uh, to the referendum and had voted for yes, there would still have been a small uh, uh, majority for leaving the European Union. So, so uh, I think my first point here really is that a lot of the decisions that are being taken against the young, I think it's, it's as it is. I mean, it is a reflection of the fact that voters have become older and they make their voice, uh, voice heard in, uh, in parliamentary elections and so on and so forth. Now, is that a reason to despair? Um, well, yes and no. I think there's still some, some reason for hope, and perhaps that's my second message that at least I want to sort of pitch to you, and perhaps that's something we can discuss a bit more. Uh, and I think, Louis, you mentioned that also. I think uh, the power um, that uh, you now have with modern technology to drive down messages and, you know, really be heard is so much more significant than, I think, what we had 20 years or 30 years ago. I mean, this is... You know, what, what happened with the Florida uh, school shooting, I find it really a fascinating, a fascinating example of how a, a small group of, you know, young students, um, high school students, didn't even need any PR agencies, they didn't need any money, you know, they, they basically knew how social media worked and became extremely effective in shaping the debate in the U.S. on, on gun control. And... Um, while they haven't won yet, unfortunately, I think they, they have already won some small victories in, in that battle. And they have done this because they have had the social media access and the ability to organize and make a really, really strong impact on the overall public debate. And arguably many of the older people, the above 50, um, are probably a little bit less, uh, uh, um, let's say, knowledge, knowledgeable even in using these kind of technologies and therefore less able to, to shape debates. So I, I, think, I think actually you need to participate uh, if you want to make your voice heard. You're in a minority. You're getting to be, becoming to be in a minority. In seven years, I'm crossing the threshold. So uh, uh, your next seven years are your chance. Um, uh, and uh, in those seven years, I mean, basically now you have to, you have to shape um, the debate. And I think you can shape the debate and you can use tools that are very powerful, much more powerful than many of the tools that we have at our, at our time. Thank you. Now, we will open it to the floor for a debate. We will welcome your questions. Uh, who wants to make a start? I'll make a start. Uh, what Guntram men mentioned, Luis, um, by the way, you're not going to cross the threshold in seven years, but in somewhat a little bit less than seven years, because the threshold is going up all the time. The well, so a little age. bit more then. Yes, a little bit more. Yes. Right, a little bit more. So we have Correct. eight years, perhaps. So <laughs> uh, you described uh, young people, the young Europeans, as something like a few some, uh, that... Uh, the European Union is going to use, uh, but they're growing fewer. We have a demographic problem in the Union. There aren't enough, there's a skills gap in many industries, there aren't enough um, young workers entering the workforce. Uh, we will have many problems in the future, both when it comes to pensions for the uh, older ages and uh, issues dealing with the workforce. Um, do you see this as an opportunity for fewer young people to have a stronger impact, or do you see this as a major problem, as many other considerations? I think, yeah, can you hear it? No, it works. Um, I think it, it generally is a, 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 a challenge. So, I mean, the, it is uh, an aging population, and yet we have we're still blocking migrants from entering the continent. You know, skilled, talented migrants with a lot of potential who could like refresh and reinvigorate the economies in Europe, which is really what Europe needs. Um, so I think, I think it really all comes down to uh, a value system again. And I, I think I always come back to this because um, the, the challenges of Europe, it, it is true, young people are still in a minority and, and these numbers don't seem to be changing because I mean, do you blame young people for not having kids these days? I mean, <laughs> we look at the facts on the table, like you don't have, you have precarious jobs, you can, you're not able to emancipate yourself, you're not able to buy a house, you're not able to know if, if you're gonna have a regular job for more than five years. Like, 
who in the world will want to start a family with these conditions? So I, I think unless that radically changes, this is going to continue while, then, while other people from across the world see Europe as an inspiration and are wanting to drastically change their lives and come to Europe because they have this hope and this, you know, this inspiration across the world that Europe is the place to come. And yet, for some reason, even though our values speak that these people should be able to come and, and be part of the European conversation, because I don't know, we've generally forgotten, not only young people, we forgot, we're all migrants in Europe. Like, we're pretty much all migrants. And I think we've forgotten that you know, we're all, we were all refugees and migrants after two massive world wars that destroyed and devastated this continent. And w the beauty of this European project is that we were able to put that aside and, and come together to have a different conversation. And, and not allowing young people, uh, young people especially, coming from outside the Union to be part of this conversation, mostly when it's many of our member states who are causing those conflicts. Um, and to provide that opportunity that can reinvigorate, actually, because Europe needs. Europe needs more skills coming from abroad. Europe needs more uh, people to come and build lives in Europe and to, to invest in the European economy and to, to take risk in Europe. And so all of that is thing, things we need. And our values are inviting people from across the world to do that, yet our political decisions are blocking it. So, um, yeah, that, that's where... Sure, um, I think... Um... I think that there is, uh, it's important to, when we talk about, you know, the older demographic and the younger demographic, one of the key things that we can do, I think, is, is leap outside of the, a politics of interests alone. Because I think there's always an assumption that politics of, you know, direct personal interest and, you know, this is the idea people vote with their pockets and it's only about taxes. But what we do know, is actually, for a lot of, and younger voters in particular, in many cases, they are open to voting, not only around kind of, um, as I say, power, but around principles. If we look at what has actually invigorated and made people excited about uh, voting, you know, the registration drives we saw in Ireland around the marriage equality referendum, more young people registered. We have huge queues at the moment uh, around people who are registering to vote uh, in terms of the, re the referendum on abortion and access to abortion in Ireland. And they're not all young women of, you know, they, people are voting because it feels like a point of principle, an idea about what it means to be human, what it means to be in a society together, and that's motivating and exciting. And even in Scotland, a lot of the young people who voted in Scotland and who registered to vote in Scotland, they weren't, you know, ardent nationalists who, you know, were motivated by some version of Braveheart or something. They really liked that Scotland had a social model. They actually liked social, the social policies and economic policies that were happening in Scotland, and they appealed to them more than what they were seeing maybe out of the Tories and the Conservatives UK. So people get motivated by ideas of solidarity. It is actually, it's not a kind of a luxury or a thing you ask, a charity, but I think they feel it, and there is that dynamic, and we do see that there is more of that happening. Um, and social media, you know, those platforms have facilitated that narrative. And I think it's very important when we talk Young people, you know, whether well, or not there's a minority of young people now in Europe, <coughs> globally, there is, it's a majority. And we know that young people in Africa, and one thing I would really think, and it's something that was a crucial moment, and I feel like it's a skill that maybe has diminished a little bit, I think it's really important that European youth organizations link strongly with young African youth organizations. I think that has to happen. And with South American and with Asia and these kind of connections and indeed with uh, American and the organizations in the United States because I think that's part of it. It is that you have an idea of young people because I think it was very true what was said. You kind of feel, <clears throat> you know, you're it now. You know, you will be making, you know, you are really now the people who are shaping. It's not that there's a future, uh, but I'll come back in a minute, it's system that you're climbing into. It's that you, you should be shaping the system now, I think. Um, so I think that solidarity thing is important, and I think it's motivating, and I think it excites people, and it is actually one of the messages that you can uh, communicate, and people understand, and they get that it's stronger. That, you know, they get that communities might be a minority in each country, but if you show solidarities to each other. And I think actually coming in on those solidarities around particular issues and particular challenges is what gives people then an empowerment to go back into political politics. So we have to recognize that for some people, it will be feeling kind of common cause with somebody in Portugal and somebody in Germany around an issue that brings them into political engagement, and then that becomes what motivates them on. And I think it's, but there is that question, just the last thing up there, of 
people are saying about social media and platform. Those platforms are important, but it's really important, the same as with politics, that we recognize any political space that has been won has been a hard one. The platforms that are there are that it's very important that people don't just participate within or use platforms or shape, but that they 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 challenge the platforms. And that's why I think I would really appeal to young people to be strong about challenging the platforms, including social media platforms like Facebook, but like obviously you know that's Facebook's long and gone. But you know, but be it you know Twitter, be it Instagram, to be challenging the platforms and look to the space you're in. And it's like the challenge all of those of us who are in representative politics, we always have to kind of keep that part of our head where we say, we're talking about the issues, but we're willing to challenge this, not just the decisions, but we're willing to challenge the decision-making system when that's necessary, when that creates the obstacle. Um, so anyway, yes. sorry. Uh, and there was a hand. What, was there a hand? If, At the back. Uh, somewhere. Yes. I thought I saw one. Thanks, guys. Should I stand, stand up? up? So stand up. Hello. My name is Johnny Pan. I'm the Google Technology Policy Fellow at the European Youth Forum. Um, I'm curious about um, in my experience in relationships, for example, sometimes be, people stay together through the tough times uh, because it fulfills the narrative of what they see as the reason they're together. They have a shared value maybe that, that keeps them going. Um, issues aside, is there any narrative uh, or multiple narratives that you've heard that uh, involve youth about where we're all going that keep you inspired uh, as kind of a carrot? As opposed, we've talked a lot about a lot of sticks, a lot of negatives that we're having to deal with. But are there other carrots that you that you've uh, heard that excite you about where we could go? I think everyone should answer that. Yeah. You, you so. Johnny, as always, asking the right questions. Um, so, I, I mean, I think for, for me, what is really curious about, especially young people in this particular generation, is that, I mean, this y young generation is driving innovation, is driving competitiveness, you know, is driving a lot of progress, but all of it, but this they do all that not putting in danger the solidarity piece. So, th th I think young people generally are aware that because they're in a, minor, in a minority, because they have been out of the power structures and because they've grown up in, a, in an era of so much diversity and so much connection and they realize this, they, they acknowledge the stories of struggle of other people their, their age, they're able to connect with young people across the world who've had that struggles. I think young people are willing to still drive that disruption and that innovation and that progress, but not putting in danger the, the social component, and that that for me is like something that stands out. Whatever, where wherever we go, is like young people want to disrupt the system, want to change, but they want to create safety nets and they want to create mechanisms for others to come in. And no matter what political party they come from, so I think there's generally inside all of the political parties, the young generation is saying, "Great progress, progress, innovation, but safety nets for those who haven't had chances uh, to to be able to." participate in the conversation as well. So I think that, that is something that I pick up, uh, especially from across the different groups, that the, the, the solidarity component for people their, their age is very present. Good from the carrots. Yeah, so, so Look, I mean, if you ask me what sort of the carrot um, of the European Union and what drives, uh, drives and why do I think this is actually important, this European project, I mean, I, I would say uh, uh, it's really um, uh, the only chance we have to shape um, the, global, the global agenda. Um, otherwise, we are all very small states uh, on all the major issues that will affect all of, all of our lives. I mean, uh, uh, Roberta mentioned GDPR. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard this, this is a general data protection regulation um, that, um, uh, you know, it sounds very technical, but it actually is about your privacy rights, right? And it's about the rights you have uh, in terms of who holds your data and who uses your data and how your data are being used. Now, do you really think that we could have uh, gotten serious privacy rights that um, Malta, the Maltese uh, citizens, would have gotten serious privacy rights without the European Union? I don't think so. Now we have a European Union that actually sets these privacy rights and that lead Mark Zuckerberg in his hearing in the US Congressional Congress to actually cite the European Union's privacy rights. I think that was a sort of a fantastic moment for the European Union uh, that he in US Congress actually cites a US uh, a, a EU regulation 
as something that uh, would apply to, to Facebook um, and that you would consider um, applying to Facebook. I thought that is was... It, a, is he's he coming now. Yeah, he's coming to Brussels now. Right? So I, I thought that was a fantastic point. Let me, I mean, also on trade. I mean, let's, let's talk a bit about the trade, the trade stuff. I mean, we have a global conversation on trade. We have now a person in the White House that uh, sort of says, well, I don't care about international rules. I'm just going to bully um, everybody else into what I think is the best trade policy for, for the United States, and I don't care if the others lose. Well, guys, I mean, all of us can be affected by this and uh, can be quite negatively affected by this. Do we really think that if uh, even the German trade minister was going alone there, he would have any chance to leverage um, and you know, to, to get something out of this discussion? Of course not. I mean, we need to work together on these things. And I think, I think at the end of the day, I mean, even in the migration field, I, I mean, there's a lot of conversation now that the EU is responsible for the migration crisis or whatever. I always thought that's completely false. I mean, uh, if anything, the EU has allowed us to uh, uh, debate and discuss common solutions. Now, these were all very imperfect, all have shortcomings, but at least we had a space, a forum, where we could discuss these issues properly. So I, I really think it's, it's about our influence in the world and the way we will be influenced by the rest of the world. Will we be just, you know, basically uh, a, a small, a small, small guys that will all be swallowed by the big guys, or do we have a chance to shape uh, ourselves a little bit uh, uh, what's happening on a global stage. I think that's that's our only chance, working together, and the EU is the place to do this, really. Uh, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting. I've, uh, this, I'm grabbing for the, this mic. Um, in terms of the common positive thing that is there, I think um, one thing is that I think that, there, I think that young people around the world now have a, a stronger, a deeper understanding of sustainability. I think it's a word for many in politically, but I think a lot of young people, they do get it. They get climate change. They, they understand that that's an issue. They understand. I, I, I think I was starting, I don't know if I can remember if I said it, but it was a quote I was <coughs> struck by. I was at a, a college. It was a, an event for new young teachers who were coming up from diverse backgrounds. And, and the phrase that was used that we're not just talking about a, a better future, but a viable future, that that's actually what's at stake. And they get sustainability is something we get. And I think the sustainable development goals on a global level, the climate change targets, they're that top level political commitment, but they should be an instrument of excitement. And I think exactly the kinds of those two pulse points, I think, where there is opportunity for that connection between uh, the young people in Europe and young people in, you know, in Africa and South America around the world. So I think sustainability is something that they actually feel and understand the threat. And I think that young people have had a stronger grip and have indeed have pressed and led on climate change consistently and, and made that um, uh, uh, when we have old industries that have been hanging on hard, um, that they have pressed them. Um, I think that younger people now are, are comfortable with multiple identities, which is, I think, really important. I think we have people, you know, people are, you know, happy to say, you know, what, yeah, I'm from Galway or, uh, and I'm Irish, but I'm also, you know, part of, you know, an LGBT community, but I'm also part of a, you know, hacker movement, or I'm also part, you know, people have different identities, and they can hold different identities quite comfortably, and they can see the connections, and they can jump past borders. We still, you know, have our states as instruments for effective change. So I think there absolutely is, a, a, there is that capacity to have different identities, and to have to, I think a challenge then is to translate that into different spheres of influence. So it was important we mentioned the young people in, in the US. Um, it wasn't only in social media that they helped shape that debate and that pressure. They also turned up in you know, local level decision making halls where legislators who weren't used to being watched were making decisions and watched them and pressed them. So I think it was that combination of offline and online uh, pressure that really kind of so it says so the online space kind of has an amplification space in that regard but again um, I think something that is that's why it's precisely because these new spheres of interaction are so important that we need we have to move past much as with the European Union we don't want to kind of blindly cheerlead but we need to say how does it work better we do need similarly to challenge online platforms and spaces and to ensure that people are not turned simply into the product, but that they can maintain both their privacy and the capacity to participate in a way that's authentic and that th those connections. And I think that's very important. And yes, 
absolutely. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, referenced the GDPR when he turned up, but he also just last week uh, moved 1.5. Uh, 1.3 billion accounts out of Europe, so they wouldn't be affected by the GDPR. And you know, we will have a huge regulatory challenge as as legislators, as well as as users and participants in social platforms, a challenge. But I think it is the example of something we can do collectively, and it's something because this space is so important. We need to be people need to be empowered in it. So I think, anyway, those are I think the sustainability. I think the multiple identities. I think the ability to think big. I, it is a very very exciting time and I think that the, there are new skills that young people are bringing now that they can bring to that we maybe didn't have before. Uh, is there anyone else? Yes? If you can stand up and tell us your name. Hello, uh, my name is Dimanta Ramkuta. I'm from Lime. Thank you very much for the, your, your thoughts, it's very interesting. And uh, I wanted to ask, like, we have these discussions about global things, and we've mentioned that European Union is even like a global rule setter by, by laws, by economical um, aspects. But, um, well, my question is about like more what we can do in our local level. Because we had like several thoughts on that, but I think that the, the most activities should be run in our national states to promote it uh, within our, our, our um, um, citizens. Uh, so that would be the first question. And the second question is um, more about the identity of European, because you already mentioned that we can have identity, many identities, right? But how, how that European identity looks like? I'm very interested in that because, well, in Lithuania, well, I'm from Lithuania, so we have a lot of uh, discussions how European looks like, what, what's identity. And so I would be interested to hearing your thoughts as well. Thank you. Uh, since Guntram would like to, to leave the airport very soon, would you be the first to answer? Well, yeah, I have to leave to the airport, I'm sorry as well. Busy <laughs> <the> airport. <laughs> I'm flying to Sofia, in fact. So. Great. Well, anyway, so... Um, no, look, I, 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 I don't really... Can, I cannot say much on the, local, on the local thing. I mean, I certainly do, do agree with you that... Um, I think one of the key, uh, and I think you see that also in the Brexit referendum, you see it in, uh, you see it even in the Trump vote. I mean, there is a sort of a, a tension between, let's say, the local level um, and the urban centers, which are very global often. Um, and uh, I do think that this tension between um, sort of the city, uh, the, the, the global urban cities, and the countryside, um, is one of the, the most important tensions um, that we have in our societies in terms of inequality, access, um, and so on and so forth. And so, um, uh, I mean, you, you look at electoral outcomes, they are very different, um, by the way, in France, in Germany, uh, in the UK, and in the US, you see a very similar pattern uh, that uh, 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 sort of the votes for the more the, let's say, the more extreme parties often happen uh, in very rural places that don't have the kind of access that you know you guys enjoy here being in Brussels, right? Uh, so, so I think that's that's certainly one one important thing uh, we need to look at, and I think we I don't think we look enough into this. Now, this is at the end of the day, it's not uh, probably not for the European Union to solve all of this, right? I mean, this is a, a lot of this has to do with national politics, right, and national uh, national policy making, um, and I think a lot can be done there, and a lot needs to be done there. Now, on the identity, well, I, I think, look, I mean, at, in, I'm, 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 this is just sort of just talking, sort of freely speaking. I, I mean, uh, I think we all have at some level different identities, right? I mean, so uh, we have a local identity, right? We have perhaps a re religious identity. Perhaps we have a, a national identity. Perhaps we also have a European identity. I don't think these things have to be in conflict. And I think uh, part of the richness of Europe is that the identity is actually, well, there's some shared identity, but there's very different identities uh, for all of us. And I think that's actually okay. I mean, that's part of our diversity. Wonderful. And with that, we would like to thank, thank Guntram you. Wolf for his participation. And I would like to ask the, the final pan panelists to answer both questions. The European identity question is an ideal question to, to wrap things up, and also any closing statements you may have. Um, uh, so there were, there were two questions, the question of the local level and the national level. Uh, 
So I'm a national level politician and I just talk about Europe all the time and they're why are you guys because I do think it is important that we have we bring that discussion, that that sense of you know what you're doing here affects and impacts and has a so it, it it's vital I think that at the community level in terms of political engagement we have that discussion that people see there is a route that it's not a, a single one-way street, that just some European funding comes down sometimes, or a European rule comes down. And there has been, I think, a laziness sometimes in national politics where you kind of, we talk about Europe made us do it, or Europe, so it's, imp you know, or else we're waiting for European money. So it tends to be a very passive relationship, and it has to be that idea, I think, of basically being that even at local level, we're having a debate around an issue, and that they see that route upwards. And I think a lot of damage was done during the, the, the period uh, of the fiscal targets. I think the European semester process, though it seems very dry, it's vital that that has social components in it, because at the moment, it's kind of the rule that came down from Europe, and it was about spend, financial spending. And there's no, there's no sign of, and Europe came in to the debate we're having in society around X or Y social policy. I think that's important to make those connections from the local community level and for national politics and for civil, for youth groups in national countries to challenge national politicians and local politicians about their views and to say that we know you have power of influence and how are you using it and what's your, and you know, really dragging out. You know, when a minister goes to a European Council of Ministers, it's almost never reported or debated what they say. So I think those questions, and it, that's kind of part of part of it, because in the end, you know, councils and ministers are making decisions all the time, and they are national politicians in a European space. But I think, so I think there's a level of holding to account and making people excited about that and having that sense that we need examples. So we should celebrate, for example, when you get a local town that has, you know, a TTIP free zone or CETA free zone in a local town. You know, there was a rural county in Ireland that became a TTIP free zone, and I think it was important because it sent a signal like, we have a view on European trade policy, which actually should be celebrated by the European institutions, but is very often resented by them. But I think, in fact, it's, it's democracy in action. And it's exciting. Around the question of the European identity, I think, you know, every now, because I, I'm thinking about war and peace a lot, it's probably obvious from my opening speech, um, every, every country has, you know, its, you know, national tragedies and its, national moments of vision and the, the thing that the, the, the decisive and we all have those as part of our national identity um, but I think there have also been collective moments in Europe I mean we're a hundred years after the end of World War One and the, the millions who died in, in World War One you know we're just over about 60 years after the you know we're just a bit further after the Treaty of Rome I've got that wrong in the years but anyway about 60 years I think after the Treaty of Rome as well, so which was again that idea of an imagining. So I do think we have to be excited about build those moments of both, be it both tragedy or insight or vision, and kind of that's part of the European identity, and I think it should be. And I think it's also the big part of the European identity. Is, and there's been often a, this narrative of kind of is um, that you can be very, very different. You know, Ireland and Italy and. Bulgaria, you know, they're very different, but that you can be very different and you can work together and make effective decisions together is in itself an extraordinary example and an extraordinary identity to be able to do that. That idea, it was, it's kind of shows um, a collective European faith in humanity's capacity to talk across the difference and to have diversity and still work together. And that's why I think European Union is so important um, as an example to the world, because we haven't, even the, you know, the UN isn't in that space yet. I want the UN to be in that space, but we aren't in that space. So that's why we are the example of how you can be different and work together. And I think that if we can make that be something that Europeans feel proud of, it has benefits both in terms of our national discussions that we're having, and it has benefits in terms of the global discussions. So if we can kind of catch that off, <laughs> because that's, what's, that's what makes me excited about it. Thanks. Yeah, so very fast. I mean, I am a cities person. I, I work a lot with cities, and I know Patricia at the back also works with your cities and is part of our members. I, I think cities are generally 
they don't have the space they deserve in the European conversation. Slowly, they are getting it. And I think cities are the entry point to many of the challenges that we're discussing. Because sustainable development, climate change, uh, equity, they won't be solved on a European level. I mean, it's great that they're discussed on a European level and resources are allocated and participate. But this is, the cities are really where, where things happen. It's, they are the hubs of innovation and progress and, 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 things, ha and things happen. But they're also the main... The, the main hubs for pollution, for discrimination, for violence, for terrorist attacks, all of these things. So I think using cities as the entry point, and I think we at the, at the European Youth Forum see that through our, the, the program that we have through the European Youth Capitals. We see young people being real disruptors and being able to connect the topics that are global or regional to city level and be able, be able to have debates around sustainable development, about what participation on the SDGs and, and, and the global uh, 2030 agenda on a, a city level means, and what is the contribution of my city or my town or my village to reaching those goals? Because, I mean, I come from Spain. Spain will not reach the 2030 agenda because the government one day wakes up and this is, decides they reached it. It's because the towns, the villages, the cities all collectively contribute. So we've, we're able to open a space uh, for, for cities to be able to be part of a conversation and for cities to see their role. Because I think while the example you gave of, of Ireland is excellent, I mean, uh, like a, a TTIP uh, free zone in a town, that's excellent, but many times cities feel out, feel excluded of the conversation. And young people in cities uh, who maybe don't have the European perspective that we have want to be part of that conversation and want to know how do I implement the the EU goals in my city, how do I improve the environment around me? Generally, the stories of most of the volunteers here don't start on a European level. They start on how do I transform things around me? How do I help people who live in my city or my village and how do I make their lives better? And from that, that grows. So if we're able to create that space for cities as the main entry point to tackle all of the challenges, I think we will drastically increase the impact we have in, in, in the policies that we're trying to, to implement. And I, and very quickly, when it comes to identity, I mean, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think, for me, what is important is, yes, there are the different levels of, of, of there's European, there's national, there's like regional, there's, in my case, this island, you know, I come from a fragmented territory, which is not even geographically Europe, by the way. Um, so, you know, that there's all those micro-identities all, which all come together. And meaning, what being European for me might be very different than uh, being European for you. But that's all okay. You know, and that, that's so powerful. That narrative and that story doesn't exist anywhere else. But for me, the other side of the European identity is, especially the, this young generation, having that choice, you know, that there's also the, the gender identities, there's also the, the city identities, there's also the, like, what you choose to be in life, and that freedom that Europe has, and, and it is true that it's not perfect across the EU, and it, we still have a lot of, of work to do, but that choice is something that when we Europeans, sometimes we don't realize how powerful that is, and when we leave Europe, when we go to, you know, when we engage with our partners in Latin America, in Africa, uh, and they, are, they have their own struggles and their own conversations, but we realize that that freedom and that choice is also part of the European identity, and that narrative is so powerful globally that it inspires people around to, to be able to, you know, you see other regions of the world trying to set up similar models to the EU because they want to reach that that area of choice and freedom. So I think, for me, it's, it's, it's also that part is very important when it comes to, to European identity. Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, we are at 6.35 now, so let's wrap things up. This has been the Youth, Youth Up Europe, the first event in a series of events. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists and the ones who left. And I would like to thank all of you for uh, being here and listening to these new ideas. Hope it was helpful. We are going to continue the discussion outside. So a big long, uh, hand of applause for the remaining panelists. <laughs> thank, you, uh, remaining thank you so much. Let's go have a, a drink outside. <laughs>